Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about kidney stones here. This is uh, a very common reason why people come to the ER. You're going to see this a lot. Um, now, this is excruciating pain. So for that reason, the sequence of management is going to be really important. And so this is a prime candidate to come up on your CCS portion of step three. Uh, but you got to know the best initial step in these patients because um, they're going to expect you to know that. Um, knowing how to treat things is just uh, is important, but knowing uh, how to initially treat things is perhaps even more important. Um, so you'll want to know that sequence and we will get into that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, I am losing my voice, so hopefully I can make it through this video. Um, all right, so what is a kidney stone? Well, the technical name, as you probably know, is nephrolithiasis. Don't say that around patients. It sounds scary. Just say kidney stones. Basically, it is the saturation of solid crystalline material that can happen anywhere from the nephrons all the way to the distal urinary tract. It forms due to supersaturation. So for that reason, one of the risk factors is dehydration. The less water you have, the more uh, saturation uh, you can get. So that's important. Uh, people who are dehydrated have a high risk. History of nephrolithiasis. Some people are just prone to them. I've had four kidney stones in my life. They are awful. Um, I am prone to get them. My parents, neither of them have ever had a kidney stone. My sister has never had a kidney stone and she's 30. So, uh, you know, this is something that if you have a patient come in with flank pain, a lot of times they'll tell you, I've, I've had a kidney stone before and I'm having one now. And they know. Um, high protein diet, as we're going to see, particularly with uric acid stones, high salt diet, white, male, and obese males outnumber females by about two to three to one. The presenting symptoms are unmistakable, excruciating, colicky, flank pain radiating to the groin. So these patients are going to be holding their back and every few minutes they're going to get this ouch, ouch, ouch pain and then it kind of goes away and then it comes back, almost like uterine contractions. Um, so it's very, very painful. They'll be moving around and that kind of helps you distinguish this from another cause of uh, sort of abdominal pain uh, in that region, which is peritonitis. Um, they also get really, really severe pain, the worst pain they've ever had, um, but they will be as still as a statue because any kind of movement exacerbates that. First step is always pain medication. Of course, provided they're stable, these patients are always gonna be stable. Uh, but the first step is always pain medication. We've got to treat that. That's just general patient care. Most important labs, you want a urinalysis, you want electrolytes, you want a urine beta HCG. Remember, this is flank pain. There can be gyne gynecologic causes, um, which we want to identify. It's also going to be important for uh, our imaging modality of choice. Spiral CT is going to be used for most patients to identify the stone. However, if the patient is pregnant, then you want to do a renal ultrasound because we don't want to be uh, subjecting the fetus to ionizing radiation. And of course, that's going to be be where we do the CT. All right, this is your differential of flank pain, so keep some of this in mind, especially these gynecologic causes, testicular torsion. Um, this is a flank pain that radiates to the groin, so it can look very similar to ovarian or testicular torsion. Um, and then, you know, some of these other things. Musculoskeletal pain um, is very common. Again, with any musculoskeletal pain, you can often uh, reproduce the pain with deep palpation. Uh, so the etiology varies depending on the stone. Um, so about 80 to 90 percent of nephrolithiasis is caused from calcium stones, usually calcium oxalate stones. Uh, but can be calcium phosphate as well. Struvite stones are associated with urinary tract infection, so look for that more in women because they're at higher risk for UTI. Uh, Proteus mirabilis is a urease-positive organism, so by splitting urea, um, you can get these stones. A uric acid stone, of course, associated with anything that you would associate with gout, so gout itself, 
tumor lysis syndrome, they've got a hematologic malignancy, and they are on uh, chemotherapy, uh, a high protein intake. Um, so uh, this is another cause. Uh, look for this possibly in older people or uh, cancer patients. Cysteine stones, uh, because there's a congenital association, um, we're probably going to see this in kids. And then we have some of the rarer types of stones. The one I want to draw your attention to here is indinavir. Indinavir is a protease inhibitor that is given for HIV. It's a very effective medication. However, this can cause stones and that's a big problem. And this presents a diagnostic challenge because indinavir stones are not visible either on x-ray or CT. Now, there is a common stone that you can't see on x-ray, and that would be the uric acid stone. It is radiolucent. However, you typically can see it on CT and on ultrasound. Here's a number of medications that can cause uh, stones. The one I really want to draw your attention to, though, is loop diuretics, and that's because you should know that loop diuretics decrease calcium reabsorption, leaving more calcium in the tubules, which can then form stones. Okay, this is one way you can go about this. It's always important to get your serum calcium. If a patient is hypercalcemic, it's almost certain that they are producing some sort of calcium stone, probably a calcium oxalate stone. Make sure, uh, because it's a symptomatic hypercalcemic patient, that you're working them up for hyperparathyroidism. If they've got a normal calcium, it certainly does not exclude calcium stones, but you may want to consider the others based on their history. This is another way you can uh, conceptualize it. Okay, so calcium oxalate stones are the most common. Uh, they make up about 70 to 80% of stone cases, and they are envelope-shaped. Very, very important you know that. So they kind of look like this, all right? They look like envelopes. These develop in acidic urine, and there are a number of important causes besides hypercalcemia, Big one that's commonly tested is inflammatory bowel disease. Why does that happen? Here's your bowel. Um, you have calcium. You have oxalate, normally there. And then you have fats. Well, as we know, with malabsorption, there's going to be remaining fat. And that fat is going to pair with the calcium. As a consequence, oxalate is all by itself, and it gets absorbed to a greater degree than it ordinarily would, thus increasing your oxalate level, which will then make it to the kidneys. Now, normally, the calcium and the oxalate will, uh, will join in the intestine, and that's fine. You know, yeah, maybe it forms crystals, but they're not in your kidney. Um, you know, they'll be pooped out. So um, this is sort of how it happens with these malabsorptive uh syndromes. And another thing is that uh, it is believed that inflammation of the intestine itself increases oxalate reabsorption. Another is ethylene glycol poisoning, just because oxalate is a byproduct of uh, ethylene glycol metabolism. And we, I talked about that uh, in a previous video. So you can see here envelope shape. They can also be dumbbell shaped like that. Calcium phosphate stones are porcupine shaped, so they kind of look like that. And I got a picture. These develop in alkali urine, uh, but they are the second most common cause of, uh, of nephrolithiasis. Um, very similar causes to calcium oxalate crystals, uh, but uh, really here we're talking about hypercalcemia. Um, this is not going to happen in things that increase oxalate availability like IBD that we just talked about. So you can see again here, porcupine shaped. Notice that you have a little envelope shaped crystal here. And that is because this patient has both calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate stones. So probably a patient who's very hypercalcemic. Struvite stones. These are also called triple phosphate stones, ammonium, magnesium, phosphate. Uh, these are strongly associated with UTI uh, caused by a urease positive organism. Usually it's Proteus mirabilis, uh, but it can also be Klebsiella species. Uh, these are coffin shaped stones. So they kind of look like that. They're not envelope shaped. Envelope shape looks more like an X on it. So these are coffin shaped. And uh, again, these form an alkali urine, so a little bit uh, different from our uh, from uh, our calcium oxalate stones, um, and as we're going to see, uh, uric acid and cysteine stones. Um, 
this you would suspect in a, usually it's a woman because women are uh, at higher risk for UTI. In a woman who has had dysuria recently and now she's coming in with a sudden development of flank pain, be very careful. Do not jump to pyelonephritis. Absolutely, it should be on your differential, uh, but you've got to be careful. Make sure you're considering the possibility of struvite stones. Okay, so you can see more coffin-shaped here. Uric acid stones are diamond-shaped. Um, they uh, occur in acidic urine, um, so look for a urine with a pH of under 5. Um, this is naturally a result of high serum uric acid levels that make its way to the kidney and then form stones. Associate this with anything that ups your uric acid levels, like hematologic malignancies, tumor lysis syndrome, um, high protein consumption, um, just because of the breakdown of purines, and then they may have a, uh, a history of gout, which is just reflective of their high uric acid levels. Uric acid stones are radiolucent, so they won't show up on x-ray, but they uh, may show up on renal ultrasound, and they'll probably show up on CT as well. So you can see these have more of a diamond shaped, but they can be a little bit tricky to differentiate from the cysteine stones. I'll show you a picture of that. Um, it's fairly easy, though, to differentiate the two just based on the history. All right, so cysteine stones are always caused by the genetic disorder cystinuria. Cystinuria is an autosomal recessive disorder uh, of the uh, channels in the nephron. So basically, the dibasic amino acids like uh, cysteine, ornithine, lysine, arginine, um, they, you can't reabsorb them properly, and so they sit around in the kidneys, and cysteine can form stones. Um, so it makes up about 1% of stones overall, but about 4 to 5% of kidney stones in children. So this needs to be on your radar for a child presenting with symptoms consistent with a kidney stone. Uh, often this is the first presentation of cystinuria. These crystals will be hexagonal shaped. As you're going to see, they look similar but quite different from the, uh, from, from the uh, uric acid stones that we just talked about. Make sure if you do diagnose a cysteine stone that you get a urine cysteine level. So you can see here, they all have six sides, right? Uh, but this is, these are more, the sides are more equal in length as opposed to something that may look more like that. So here, again, you can see a comparison of these uh, various stones that we've talked about. The only one missing is calcium phosphate. Remember, calcium phosphate is that porcupine-shaped stone. Okay, so remember that the first step when you got a patient coming in with excruciating flank pain is always going to be analgesia and hydration. Then your next step, which is very important, is to get a beta HCG that needs to be on your initial order list on CCS because it not only dictates how we treat the patient, but it also dictates how we image the patient. Now, NSAIDs are the analgesic of choice. However, in my experience, that is just not enough for most patients. And although we do have an opioid problem in this country, there is a time and place for opioids, and this is one of them. This is absolutely one of them because the pain is just excruciating. Uh, other supportive management ensure adequate hydration. Not only does that prevent the further formation of stones, but it also helps flush out the stones that are there. Prevent vomiting. Use an antiemetic if necessary. We don't want these patients to volume contract. Ensure adequate renal function. And then start IV antibiotics if there's a suspected infection, things like bacteria, fever, elevated esterase, uh, elevated white count. Those are all indicators that you're dealing with an infection. You want to give antibiotics right away there. Definitive management is a look, to look at the CT and estimate the size. If it's less than 10 millimeters, we can manage this expectantly, or we can do something called medical expulsion therapy. Medical expulsion therapy is where we give a medication, an alpha-1 blocker, so tamsulosin or Flomax, uh, and that relaxes the smooth muscle of the ureter, and so it allows the stone to pass more easily. There's conflicting evidence on whether this is um, beneficial, uh, but it doesn't really hurt. So I would recommend trying this, um, especially if you're dealing with a, a stone that's on the larger end uh, of under 10 millimeters, so like 8 millimeters or something. If it's more than 10 millimeters or they failed medical management, they're unable to pass, or if they have an infection, 
then you need to do a urology consult and get surgical intervention. Usually that's going to be shockwave lithotripsy, but you should know that shockwave lithotripsy is contraindicated in pregnancy. So we'll do a ureteroscopy in those patients. Discharge them on hydration, and if they've had repeated stones, a low-protein diet. What we don't do is send them home on a low-calcium diet that is not beneficial, and that is a wrong answer choice on your exam. Here you can see a CT of a patient with a kidney stone. They are very easy to see. They are stones, after all. Um, and then here you can see on the right, or sorry, on the left, no, on the right, what am I talking about? Um, on the right here, you can see what they're pointing to is hydronephrosis. So you can't see the stone on B here, um, but what you can see is a hydronephrosis, and that makes sense because blockage in the ureter increases hydrostatic pressure in the kidney, which causes hydronephrosis. Um, so again here, you can see it right smack in the middle of the ureter. Here you see it at the VUJ, right where the ureter comes into the bladder. All right, so I want to point out, this is important, if you have a confirmed stone based on CT and there are signs of an infection, either symptoms or signs, that's an immediate urology consult and broad-spectrum antibiotics, I would use something like ampicillin and gentamicin. General management is hydration and dietary modification. We talked about that. Low calcium diet, not recommended. Outpatient, uh, if they have repeated stones, you want to get an idea of some of the chemicals that are in their urine. So urine calcium, urine oxalate, urine citrate, urine urate, and urine cysteine. Um, but I would reserve that for pediatric patients. If hydration and dietary management don't suffice, there's a number of other things that you can do. Um, you don't need to memorize these, but one thing I would know is for the calcium stones, because they are so common, uh, a useful way to go about this is to give hydration and thiazide diuretics. Okay, why would we give thiazide diuretics? Because thiazide diuretics increase calcium reabsorption in the kidney. And so because of that, we'll have less calcium in the tubules. And if you have less calcium in the tubules, you're less likely to form a stone. This is shockwave lithotripsy. It is not a pleasant procedure. Usually we do use sedation for this. Remember, contraindicated in pregnancy. That's important to know. So we would do a ureteroscopy if we need a surgical management for them. And then this is everything we talked about. So you can see here um, the shape of the stone, the long-term treatment, um, the associations. Make sure and know everything, though, about calcium oxalate because it is the most common stone uh, that you will run into in your practice.